Today we are joined with a very special guest, someone whom Joe Rogan has dubbed the single greatest trainer and coach in martial arts of our current generation. For us is a genius, le legitimate genius. Someone who has a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and someone who trains the greatest fighter of our time, George St. Pierre, otherwise known as GSP. Just to give you an insight or an impression into the strength of this man, this is a video of him dismantling the strongest arm wrestler in the world. A graduate of philosophy, he can not only outgrapple you physically, but also intellectually. For us, Zahabi, an absolute honor. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. We're going to start off with some rapid fire questions. Sure. <laughs> just want to get into the mindset of Firas Zahabi. So the first one's a scenario. Say you're approached in the street by someone bigger than you. Uh, you try to obviously disengage. They want to engage. They want to fight you. What's your discipline of choice? Um, if there's a potential of multiple attackers, I would keep it standing. One person. One person. I know one it's person. only one person. Yes. Uh, I would probably... Uh, actually, I'll, I'll probably box my way, like punch my way into a takedown. I would say I'd try to take the person down because I can minimize the amount of violence if I use jujitsu. You know, jujitsu is a, it's a gentle art, so there's a lot of ways to subdue an opponent without having to injure them seriously. So, ultimately speaking, I think I'd rather use jujitsu techniques. Awesome. Three people approach you. One of them has weapons. What do you do? Then you get, then you can't use jujitsu at all because if you're grappling with one individual. The other one's gonna he's gonna ha blindside you. So and then I would use a combination of Muay Thai, kickboxing, and boxing. Do you run? Would I run? No, I don't think so. I <laughs> uh, what's your favorite submission? I have my favorite submission would probably be um, the rear naked choke because you don't have to actually injure the person. But uh, the submission, I think that is most dangerous is the inside heel hook. But if I had to pick one, I'd probably pick the rear naked choke. Yeah, yeah. We'll go for an Islamic spin now. What's the most hard hitting Quran verse right now that speaks to you on a personal level? Um, Surah Ikhlas for sure is for certain is my favorite. And I think it's so so profound. So uh, um, it, it, if you contemplate on it, if you think about it, once you, you know, I've been studying philosophy for over 20 years and I see the Surah Ikhlas as, something so uh, powerful on a mystical level. I think if somebody journeys, uh, uh, goes on a spiritual journey, Surat Ikhlas is uh, something incredibly hard hitting and profound. Beautiful. Um, who's, in your opinion, the greatest fighter in human history? Ooh, that's really that's heavy really question, but the right person question. to ask. Yeah, I would say it's Come between Khabib and, and St. Pierre. You know, wow, it's really human history. Human history, yeah. Wow. Because, yeah. What about Genghis Khan? Oh, we're talking about combat sports. No, I combat think. sports. Like combat sports. We're talking about like warriors. We're talking about warriors. I mean, yeah, Genghis Khan, he's never been undefeated. He's undefeated on the battlefield. But I was thinking about like hand-to-hand -hand combat. Hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat, it would, it would be between St. Pierre, I think, and uh, Khabib. Uh, world, I mean, that would be, that'll be very difficult to say. Okay, we'll give you a pass on that. Well, no, but Khabib, definitely. I think that's unquestionable. Our viewers are going to be happy with Khabib. But then again, <laughs> well done, I, I well think done. they should also be happy with GSP, considering that GSP is uh, Khabib's dad, uh, Abdul Manap Nurmagomedov, his favorite yeah, fighter really is GSP. Mashallah. This guy was my father's favorite fighter. You know, it's like, I grew up watching his fights. You know, it's honor to stay with him here. And, you know, it's my pleasure, brother. My that's pleasure. That's that's pleasure. That's uh, last question, the greatest philosopher. Look, my my, great, my favorite thinker is Ghazali. I just feel that Imam Ghazali was very misunderstood, very very misunderstood. So um, I, I think uh, it's a shame that the Muslims today they don't know Ghazali and they actually misunderstand him heavily. So I find it to be a, a great shame. Oh, Imam Al Ghazali, yeah, beautiful, noted in gold. Uh, we wanna we wanna touch more on that later. Uh, but at the beginning, Kamal mentioned some of your accolades, just a little bit. Um, if someone were to ask you, you know, who is Firas Zahabi, how would you respond? I would just say a regular guy, you know, just a 
guy who loves uh, sports and like a man who loves to study philosophy you know nothing nothing else Mashallah. very simple very humble Allah yubarik fik Allah protect you Amen. very humble okay. I wanted to ask you a question which is like currently like screaming out on social media and today's culture like it's very popularized amongst people within the martial arts to convert to Islam so we see somewhat of an affinity between fighters and Islam so we see famous boxers converting to Islam whether that's obviously Muhammad Ali the most famous Mike, Mike Tyson, Tyson. Mm. Um, we have even some today uh, Devin Haney that have converted to Islam that's right. even amongst the UFC as well we see a lot of uh, fighters converting to Islam one of your fighters has converted to Islam Kevin Lee I believe and also in Australia we have someone by the name of Jake, Jake Matthews, Matthews yeah. from Melbourne also converting to Islam. Oh, really? yeah. I didn't know so on a personal level, someone who is in within the industry, have you experienced this affinity towards Islam amongst fighters? Oh yeah, no, I've definitely seen uh, And why? Yeah. Well, you know, after after 9/11, it wasn't cool to be Muslim. Everybody was hating on Islam. It was uh you see a lot of people try to distance distance themselves from Islam, you know. It was uh it was actually a scary time. However, now you're seeing the opposite. Mm -hmm. People are gravitating towards Islam. I mean, Andrew Tate converted to Islam. Yeah. I mean, like, uh, yeah, I don't know if you saw recently, uh, Sam Harris was trying to explain this phenomenon. Why are these young kids converting to Islam? He was crying. Yeah, he, he was, was crying. Miserable. You see, he has a broken heart. Yeah. This is, the man's a broken heart, man. Mm. But look, you have, I, I call it the great fork. You know, there's a fork. It's, you have to choose religion or nihilism. Mm -hmm. Then, okay, which religion? I think this you know, monotheism is always going to be here. Monotheism is the first and first religion. People think it's polytheism. It can't be. Before you know about two gods, you have to know about one God. Mm -hmm. Monotheism came first. You learn the number one. You don't learn the number two. It's a, it's a logical necessity that one comes before two. We all are born with innate belief in God and Islam defines it perfectly. That's why, you know, I always try to uh, tell people, you know, Islam is a natural religion and it's a re revealed religion. So when you tell people about Islam, it's kind of like you're ringing a bell that already exists in their in their heart of hearts. So for me, that's why I find that they're gravitating towards Islam. There, there are other benefits because also Islam is very pragmatic. And people take their Islam seriously, whereas other religions have, you know, taken their, other religions have relaxed their, their, their desire to defend or protect or respect the religion yeah and like recently a video was out and candace owens was, was talking about how chat gtp will make a joke about jesus but won't make a joke about muhammad Ali, Ali Salam. but we were offended equally about mm -hmm. jesus being made fun of Ali 100 percent. why will, will chat gtp do that because it knows that hey this audience is relaxed with their religion and I think that it's a shame that not all religions demand a certain level of respect because it shows like you, you don't, if you really believe something, you won't allow that something. If you find something to be sacred, you won't allow that something. Actions speak louder than words. You won't allow that something to go stepped on. You'll defend it. You'll get up and defend it if you truly believe in it. So I feel that, you know, this is uh, what people are, why people gravitate to Islam because it has, you know, the book says something and people follow it. And that means something. Whereas when the book says something and nobody regards it, it's, it's a total lack of respect or, or desire to, to really show that you really believe in something. A religion of principles where principles are upheld. Practice implemented. No, it makes sense. And like, I think there's some examples within, you know, the fight community. Certain things happened between individuals that sort of drew this, you know, uh, line in the sand. Yeah, don't talk mm. about father. Don't, don't talk about father, don't talk about religion. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, and so what actually just on that, it's a bit of a side point, but what role do you think, you know, the prevalence of like the Dagestani fighters being platformed? What what do you think that's done in terms of promoting the deen? Given they are practicing. I, I think I think the, they give a great example of what a you know successful person is. So it's like people want to copy that. They gravitate towards that. You know, here's the thing, you know, when when you're in the fight business, a lot of people will betray one another step on one another they claw their, their way to the top they want to they want to they want to use people to get to the top everybody's a everybody's this you can discard anybody you know i need this person for now when i don't need him i fire him as my manager why this other person here will make me more money 
in the Khabib camp, in the Dagestani camp, they won't do that. You know, they're family. Mm. So that kind of uh, loyalty, that kind of love, it goes further. When we're, if we're a group that backstabs one another, if I steal from you every time you turn around, and you know that, we develop a culture of, of uh, we, we develop a culture that is ultimately self-defeating. Mm. Whereas when you're down, I, I pick you up. And when I'm down, I know you'll pick me up. And I know when I turn around, you won't steal from me. I'll go the extra mile to see you survive. You know, whereas they'll start to betray each other eventually. They might work together for a while. But after when they reach certain levels of, of success, they start to fight one another. And they're so busy fighting one another that their competitors surpass them. You know, united we stand, divided we fall. Mm. This is a true axiom for the for, throughout history. The Dagestanis are very united. They're very loyal to one another. They're very disciplined. And you could trust them. You know that they won't... Uh, I, I've, got, I've had the privilege to train with them. Have you had personal insight into this on a personal yeah, level? Yeah, I've trained with them as well. I mean, mm. they're, they're just beautiful people. They're fantastic people. Mm. You know, I mean, uh, I've got to spend time with them, eat with them, train with them. They're just a phenomenal people. Have you had personal experience with the late Abdul Manat Namagamir? Actually, I have. I've, I've had the pleasure, alhamdulillah, to have discussions with him. Uh, I remember one time I was in London and they were interviewing me and I stopped the interview and I said, you should be interviewing this man, you know? Mm -hmm. This is before Khabib was fighting uh, Tony Ferguson. And I was like, he's a great trainer. He's trained Khabib. He's training you know, all these Dagestanis. That's before he became famous. But, you know, he went and he did an interview. They had a translator and we were talking about his history of training. Of course, he was an accomplished uh, judo practitioner himself. And I was, you know, telling everybody how he's developing such incredible grapplers. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, he became a, you know, superstar, of course. Khabib became world champion and, you know, he, he's he's a phenomenal trainer, but such a humble man, mm -hmm. you know. And I've had the privilege to hang out with him and Khabib and talk to him and Khabib would translate for me. And, uh, you know, I would tell him how impressed I was because I would watch their videos on YouTube of him throwing Khabib. And I was like, it's incredible, you know, that uh, his technique, and he's, he's an incredible technician, mm -hmm. his father, Khabib's father. Um, and, uh, you know, I've had the, he's a very humble man though, very mm -hmm. humble man. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I think it was a great like embodiment of showing people Islamic values. And even if you were just to analyze that relationship Khabib has with Islam Makachev, mm. it's like a friendship that is to be envied. It's a friendship, a, a sense of brotherhood that is to be envied. And it, at the same time, it speaks volumes about the Islamic values that you spoke about. When, when Khabib, when Islam Makachev won the world title, the happiest guy in that arena was Khabib. Mm. And so that was Khabib's title. And it's from, from the heart. It's not like jealousy, envy, or anything you would when, say. When Khabib won the title himself, he didn't celebrate so much. I was there in New York. I mean, he celebrated, he was happy, but he wasn't as happy as when he saw Islam Makachev Islam, win the title. Yeah. You know, these, these two brothers, they love each other. And I was there with, I was actually watching Khabib fight Poirier with Islam Makachev. And I can tell you, Makachev was very happy to see Khabib win. You mm. know, all of the brothers were very happy for him. When he wins, we all won. You know, it's just that there's a, there's a brotherhood, there's a love, there's an admiration for one another. And it's true. I mean, they love for one another what they love for themselves. And it's, it's a true Islamic, Islamic, ethos, Islamic, ethos, to it's Islamic, Islamic ethos to hold. I want to uh, switch to the other side. So we've spoken about the fighters themselves having an affinity towards Islam, but also amongst Muslim youth themselves. You see this like craze amongst Muslim youth towards the martial arts. My, I myself actually was hit with the bug. I joined the BJJ class and I, I don't really have anything. I don't have a black belt, nothing, nothing amazing, <laughs> but I'm trying my best to, to get somewhere. But there is an affinity amongst Muslims themselves towards the martial arts. Why do you think this is the case? And what advice would you give to young Muslims that are, I guess, gravitating towards this field? I think it's so important to have at least a base in martial arts. Like you could play other sports, but you better have a, a level of self-defense. It's so important because... I always tell my, my sons, you know, a man's duties has two major duties. He has many duties, but two are very important. Protect and provide. You have to be able to protect yourself and your family. And I think that's the very important uh, duty of, uh, of a man. It's in the Quran. Man mm -hmm. is a protector of women, you know. So I think we should never, no matter what society tells you, I always tell my sons, never forget this. Never forget this. I don't care what they say on the internet. I don't care. You know, there's a lot of things on the internet. Yeah. Like, yeah. My sons, hey, <laughs> yes. I disagree with this. Let me tell you why. You know, I, I think it's so important that the Muslims know why we disagree yeah. with these things. You know, No feminist pointed the finger at the Ukrainians when the Ukrainians asked the women to leave and fought mm -hmm. for their country. They're, what they perceive to be the... Regardless of where you land on the topic, whether it's right or wrong, they, they had an invasion in their country and they decided to defend their country. And 
they saw the difference between men and women, and women has to leave the country while the men stay here and fight. Now, where are the feminists to say that that's not egalitarian? Where is the perfect egalitarian? We're equal in the eyes of Allah, yes, but we're not equal in terms of role. There are things that my wife has that, that are she's more important, and there's certain things where it's this is a man's duty now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, if somebody's trying to break into my household in the middle of the night, I'm not gonna send my wife because it's her turn to go check to see what that noise is. I'm not gonna be egalitarian on that front. It's a myth that they're trying to tell their kids that we're all equal in every way. Mm -hmm. It's not true. We're equal in the eyes of Allah, of course, in value, of course. But when it comes to roles in society, when it comes to being productive in society, there are certain things where one has an advantage over the other and that has to be respected and we have to be realistic about it. Uh, I want to go into your philosophy, but before we do go into your philosophy, you've brought up the topic of feminism, masculinity, the man has a, I guess, a duty and obligation to provide and protect. Masculinity is a hot topic right now. I'm sure you're aware, anyone who's on the internet, anyone who's alive in 2023 can yeah. understand that masculinity is a hot topic right now, especially amongst Muslims themselves. Um, when I look at masculinity online, I guess sometimes we see I guess extremes on both ends of the spectrum. Like you see some Muslim male masculine influencers that make you feel like you should be, you know, making Toba <laughs> if you don't have a six pack, you should be making Toba if you, you don't have a black belt. And there's a lot of like hyper masculinity and, and at the other, on the other end of the spectrum, we have emasculinated men. Where is the balance? And I guess, have we misplaced masculinity today? I think amongst I think, the Muslims, I think there's there's extremes. You know, I don't I don't agree with everything Andrew Tate says. Believe me, mm -hmm. but I, I like his overall message. I think he's a he's he's counterbalancing a lot of what's out there. Mm -hmm. It's a reaction, yeah. It's a reaction, and mm -hmm. people are, it's music to people's ears because they're so bombarded with the opposite all the time, and they finally say, you know, finally somebody who's going to stand up and he's going to get all the arrows. He's the one who's going to get thrown in jail. He's the one who's going to yeah. get, but at least somebody's voicing their opinion. Look, feminism has really grown in, in, in strength and power. And there's a level, of course, there's a level of feminism that's needed. You know, women, of course, deserve rights, et cetera, et cetera. But also not at the cost of stepping at young men and and, and emasculating young men. Mm. And I just don't find it to be true that men are, and women are equal in every sense. I just don't find it to be true. And I think when violence is on the table or danger is on the table, we all agree to it. We all behave that mm -hmm. way. The, when the Titanic is sinking, it's women and children women first. And children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why is it women and children first? Well, men will have, men are more dispensable. If you have a population of 100 men and 100 women and the men go to war and only 50 come back, guess what? Your civilization can continue. Mm -hmm. The next generation is okay. You could repopulate your civilization. If you send 100, 100 women to war and 50 come back, you have 100 men and 50 women, guess what? You're a footnote in history now. You will, mm -hmm. you will, you will meet your demise. The champions of history were not dumb. They survived. They organized themselves in a way that was intelligent and pragmatic. We have to look back and not criticize them. We have to look back and ask ourselves, why did they behave this way? Why did, was this necessary? You know, we have something called the, the, the fallacy of uh, historian's fallacy. When you judge people from today's experiences and you, and you superimpose them on the people of the past. No, you have to go and understand the time, the culture, the way of thinking, the, the needs of that time. I think it's incredibly unfair to to project our experiences of today on the people of yesterday. But the people of yesterday were champions for a reason. And the roles of men and women were not conflated. Men had a certain role and women had a certain role. And I find it to be uh, the natural way to live. That's a, it's a very good point. And it's very interesting because like when you talk, you, you I think reflect a lot on philosophical concepts and terms. It really guides your thinking. But you're you're a martial artist initially, and then you draw into philosophy. So how do how does one end up from martial arts into philosophy? Actually, I started both pretty much at the same time. To be honest with you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, I've been I've been studying philosophy for twenty years and jiu-jitsu for twenty. Why did, for 20 but years. why would you dive into philosophy? What is it? Um, yeah. I, I I had my older brother had books lying around. I, he had books on Plato. He had. Uh, books that commentated on Plato. So I was just reading it just for fun because I was bored one day. I got really, really interested in it. And when I was really, really young, I uh, was just, I got these curious questions. You know, Plato asks curious questions in his book. So I just kind of stayed in my mind. And as I grew older, when I went to college, there was philosophy courses. I just took them out of passion, out of just desire to, out of curiosity, I should say. Mm. 
Uh, martial arts, I got into martial arts because I got beat up a lot when I was young. So I wanted to end that problem. You know, I was sick of getting beaten up. So I was really just a, a, a passion project. I Just something that I loved. I never thought that I would use it in, in the future for, you know, podcasts or anything. I had no, I had no idea about this. You know, for me, it was just a passion project. Oh, you absolutely shocked Joe Rogan when you came out with those thoughts. <laughs> if you read the comments, <laughs> you, you, you absolutely yeah. left him at a loss for words. People were like, oh, it's going right over the top of his head. But like, subhanAllah, like, like, yeah. you caught him off guard. Uh, it wasn't intentional. I thought, <laughs> I thought because, I'll be honest, at that time, I haven't really watched any of, very, I have watched very little Joe Rogan and I actually didn't want to go on the, I was very shy to go on the podcast. And I know he had philosophers on before. I know he he interviews a lot of uh, academics so i thought he had heard or known or he was aware mm -hmm. and so i thought we we're gonna talk about a topic because i i remember you know he has a lot of clips online i remember sam harris on his podcast talking about determinism and he got determinism wrong mm. and i was like you know like i want to kind of like challenge sam harris's views on determinism because they're they're actually wrong and it turned out that he, he wasn't aware of the topics and i think um, I, I was kind of surprised that maybe he didn't know this topic or that topic. So I kind of like opened up a can of worms and we're trying to like, you know, organize, you know, like maybe <laughs> deal with it, you know. But he, I, Joe Rogan's always been a gentleman. He's been very, very nice. I had a very good time talking about him. But people write me emails about that podcast till this day. I mean, it's just, uh, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> I actually just want to touch on that because you talked about religion. You talked about God on that podcast and you were drawing from philosophical, uh, I guess, your knowledge or your, or your source of information from your philosophy. So how can Muslims, I guess, tap into philosophy for the sake of da'wah, for the sake of teaching people about God, teaching people about Islam and bearing in mind that this is a very contentious. Yeah, I think, well, I've asked you a question. What's philosophy? What does it mean? Most people will define it as like, here's the thing. Imam Ghazali, he wrote a book called The Tahafut, The Destruction of the Philosopher. Destruction of philosopher is not a great translation. It's more the slip up of the philosophers. Okay, this is what Frank Griffel says. This is not the best translation. It, it's really better translated as the slip up. Ghazali proposes 27 mistakes made by the philosophers. Three of them are uh, apostasy. And these three should be dealt with. The rest, that's a matter of your opinion. I think it's a wrong opinion, but it's not that big of a deal. When he was attributing these things to the philosophers, he was talking, philosophy means, and well, the way Ghazali was using it, means the blind followers of Aristotle. They believe these things because Aristotle says it. That's wrong. Because you have to demonstrate it. Just because Aristotle said something doesn't make it true. Ghazali was very correct to hold this a view because as Aristotle was proven wrong later. Mm -hmm. Several of these problems, several, several of Aristotle's, many of Aristotle's beliefs were proven wrong. Okay. Ghazali was correct for not blind following Aristotle, where at the time it was extremely po popular to blind follow Aristotle. When he was using the term philosophy, he wasn't saying people who use reason or logic. Mm -hmm. He was saying the blind followers of Aristotle. Today when we use philosophy, the term philosophy, we're talking about logic epistemology how do we know something we cannot equivocate the two the way ghazali was using philosophy because some muslims will say oh philosophy is haram it's completely wrong if you mean blind following of aristotle's haram i agree with you blind following of aristotle's haram if you mean logic the way we use philosophy today academic uh, the study of, of logic the study of epistemology is haram i think it's wrong to say epistemology and logic is not haram. That's impossible. It's an impossibility. If you try to convince me that logic is haram, you would have to use a logical reason. Mm. You'd be in a self-defeating position. You'd be using logic to say that logic is haram. It's a self-defeating position. If you read the Quran, you cannot read the Quran and say, oh, this book is saying logic is haram. It's the opposite. The non-believers is not using logic. It's being criticized for being illogical. It's the complete opposite of what the text says. Now, if you think your logic is perfect, that's haram. So there are, there are nuances that Muslims today, they just make a blanket statement. Oh, logic is haram. Don't do philosophy. No, that's an absurdity. Where are the Muslims that say that mathematics is haram? There's none. Why? Mathematics is logic. Epistemology is a logic. Logic is not haram. Logic is 100% halal. Now, there is an Ibn Taymiyyah point that most Muslims, I find, get wrong. Ibn Taymiyyah was asking, whose logic do you use? Yeah. Aristotle and Plato, in their time, they were two great intellects. They didn't agree. Today, who are the two great intellects? Well, Schopenha Schopenhauer and, and Heisenberg. They don't agree. 
They have opposing views. You can go through every age and the two intellectuals of that age, or you can find more than two, they believe in, they have opposite positions, incompatible positions. Ibn Taymiyyah is telling you, look, if you look through the ages, whose logic are we going to use? Our logic is not perfect. We are not perfect logicians. Logic might be perfect, but your logic is not perfect. You're human. This is the nuance that most Muslims uh, don't understand. Ibn Taymiyyah was a logician. Yes. He used logic. He argued logically his entire career. He was a brilliant man. He was a, he was a genius. Now, you're going to tell me he thinks logic is haram? No, of course not. What Muslims ultimately need to understand is the fitrah is a gift from Allah. You think you rationalize to Allah. Yes, you can get to, you can get to belief in God via reason. Yeah, but that's the, the weaker of the two ways to get to Allah. You're born with a fitrah. So you're rationalizing backwards. You already have the answer to the test and now you, you figured out the test. But this is really a mercy from Allah. Everybody is born Muslim. Even if they never heard of the Quran, they were born Muslim. Muslim doesn't mean you read the Quran and then you convert it to Islam. You are born Muslim even before the scripture. In the Quran, it tells us, tell the people of the book, Abraham was on the right path before the scripture. If you read mm. the book of Genesis, you're reading the story of Abraham. What book did Abraham have? Well, he was on the right path. That's before the Bible. That's before the Torah. It's before the books of Moses. There is a natural inborn religion. There's a religion every human being is born with. Now, of course, we have a revealed religion. That revealed religion echoes the fitrah. Mm. If you have the fitrah, you can now determine which religion is correct. So this is the, the key to Islam. Because yes, yes, the dunya, if you look at the dunya, we have the problem of infinite regress. You have a father, your father had a father, his father had a father. Sooner or later, we have to come to a start. And that start cannot have a, a, a cause. We have a chain of, in, we cannot have an infinite regress. You would never get to here and now if the chain went back infinitely. We have to have what, Aristotle, every, every people in every t time in history came to this conclusion. There had to be a start. Now, Leibniz asks, what could be this start? Well, there's only one thing that could be this start, God. That's the only one thing. Everything else would need something else to bring it into creation. Mm. Everything else would be contingent. Logic points to Allah. It doesn't encompass Allah. Mm. Allah gave you logic and your senses to measure the dunya, not to measure Allah. We have to be a bit more humble with our logic. Yeah, I believe logic points to Allah. Of course, there's a problem of infinite regress. We can't, we can't get around it. Even the atheists, they need one miracle. They need, they need one miracle. And whatever, whatever it is, they, they conclude at the end of the day, they need one miracle of existence. To keep things simple, yes, it points to Allah, but nothing encompasses Allah, not human logic. The fitra is innate. It's known. You were born with it. You can't get it wrong. And that's why I don't believe there's any atheists. I don't believe there's any, I've never met one single atheist. If you bring me an atheist, bring me a PhD atheist, I'll find you some type of God he believes in. For me, atheism is polytheism. It's a plethora of ayat that just bring up philosophical arguments. Absolutely. You know, uh, the, the, the most famous of them, am khuliqu min shay'in am humul khaliqun, were they created from uh, nothing or did they create themselves? Yeah, if you, if you created yourself, you'd have to exist and then bring yourself into existence. But if you already exist, how could you bring yourself into existence? There's a logical impossibility. The Quran definitely gives a, a it definitely tells you, look, you couldn't have you couldn't have created itself. But moreover, the Quran have, goes far deeper than this. Mm. You see, like uh, I'm telling you, atheism is polytheism. Mm. It's a type of polytheism. When you eliminate all of the forces or fake gods. Because to me, that's just a god. You, you, nature is a god you invented in your mind. I doubt every god they bring me. Every god they gave me, I doubt it. That's why, you, that's why the creed is, la ilaha illallah. We doubt every, the, the, the Muslim and atheists are so close. They're so close. Like, Cartesian doubt and Ghazalian doubt is so extreme that it's next door to atheism. We doubted every god they presented to us. Even for me, the atheist is not atheist enough. He's gullible. I see him as a gullible fool because he thinks nature is a force. And I try to explain to him, I have to hold him by his hand and teach him, teach him that, no, this is just your imagination. As a matter of fact, you know, one famous thinker, he said, when I was reading Kant, he gave, he, when Immanuel Kant wrote his critique of pure reason, 
one of, one of his uh, proofreaders gave it back to him. He said, I, I give it back to you because I can't finish reading it. I, might, I feel I might become insane. You know, some, some, some thinkers, one thinker once said, you're not a man until you've read Kant because you're still in your, 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 your fantasy world. Mm. You, once, you, once you understand that you, you project things from your mind, that's why Allah says, study the dunya and the self. You're going to see that there's a lot of ghosts in your head. Once you eliminate all these ghosts, once you eliminate all these things that you cannot put in a test tube, and ironically, later on, we'll find that you can't even put the dunya in a test tube. You can't even put the world around you in a test tube. Ultimately speaking, we don't believe in any of, of these gods save one. There's one last standing. There's one last standing. You know, and I, there's, in philosophy, there's one thing we can never deny. And it's a very difficult thing to point to, but it's undeniable and it's in everybody's face. I always tell people, you know, people which say they want to find this. Like they want a shortcut to find it. It's not easy to give somebody a shortcut, but ultimately speaking, Within us, every human being, there's a point of awareness. Whether you're a logician or a scientist or, or not, you, can, you, can't, you can't deny this. To deny it is to prove it. Mm. To say you doubt it is to prove it. To doubt here is proof. So, so, you, know, you can't doubt your doubt. You prove doubt. Once you doubt your doubt, you've doubted it. There's something still that's immune to all doubt. This point of awareness, it's actually... Once, once you have a trained mind, you realize that even the idea of point is within it. Everything is, everything is encompassed by it. Even yourself is encompassed by it. It's not in you, you're in it. Even your idea of in and out, even your idea of up and down, even your idea of time, here and there, present, future, it's all encompassed within this uh, awareness. This is what Ghazali is pointing to. Ultimately speaking, there is intuition. You see, Ghazali gives a beautiful uh, example. And cut, cut me off if I'm rambling. Okay? Well, don't be shy to You're me. giving well, us a philosophy shy, class or one on one philosophy. One on one. This is very deep philosophy. <laughs> it's a, the, the, intu the intuition part actually is. Uh, the intuition it's, part. It's an important. Yes. Yes. Point. yes. Yeah. It's a point we, we want you to mention. Can't, we can't sidestep this because Ghazali wanted, Ghazali wanted absolute certainty. When you reach a level of certainty, you'll never doubt. Again, you'll yeah. never doubt again. Like no matter what anybody ever says or does, halas, you've reached certainty. You'll never doubt. You'll never even have a speck of doubt. But Ghazali takes you through a, a small journey. He tells you, look, think about when you were young, very young. If you touched something hot, you believed it was hot. If you touched something cold, you believed it was cold. If you saw something that was large, you believed it to be large. If you saw something to be small, you believed it. You didn't question your senses. You trusted your eyes. You trusted your your senses of taste, of hearing, you believed in everything that your body, all the information it gave you. And then as you started to develop, your mind started to take over. Your intellect usurps the power of your senses. Your intellect tells you, look, you see that? That's just an illusion. Like Ghazali gives the example of a shadow. Is yeah. that shadow moving? Your eyes are telling you the shadow is not moving. But if you hang out here for a while, you'll notice that the shadow does move. Mm. It was moving so slowly, your eyes can't detect it. And there's a countless level of illusions that the human uh, body goes through. Descartes gives the example of a straw. He puts a straw into a, a glass of water and he sees the straw bent, but he's like, it's impossible to bend, the, the, the straw is bent. It's the light waves that are bent. So he says, look, there's a plethora of illusions. And he says the intellect now usurps the authority of the senses. Mm -hmm. So now the intellect is in charge, so to speak. It tells us what the sense is. It filters what, we, what to believe about the senses. But Ghazali says, what if there's an even higher faculty in the future that's going to come in and usurp the power of the intellect. And that is Islam. Because in Islam, there's something, we, we have intuition. Intuition is a direct experience with God. Though. And it's in the Quran. The Quran tells us, before we came to this world, Allah asked all of humanity, who is your God? And we all took the shahada. That's why the term kafir is, it means cover. Covered what? Covered know. what? That which you know. The belief in one God. So if you don't exclaim, if you don't, if you don't express the belief in one God, that means you're in a covered state. Because we all know, now we all believe, we all know in our heart of hearts, there's one God. This is the claim of the Quran. And if somebody has some introspect, he will find this oneness. If you look at every mystics in every religion, they all come to a unity, a one. We have consensus here. Muslim, Muslim thinkers tell us, look, here we have a consensus. The highest thinkers in every religion, they come to this unity. They don't come to a trinity. That's something you had to teach me. Mm. 
You have to teach me that. I can't discover a trinity within me. And they come up with all sorts of, uh, in my opinion, you know, uh, fallacious claims. They say, oh, who was there to love if there wasn't a trinity? You'd have to have a three for, for there to be love. Because if, Allah, if God was by himself, there would be no love. Let me tell you something. I love my children before they existed. Mm -hmm. Allah has knowledge of everything. Allah doesn't have to bring, God doesn't have to bring us into existence for us to, to be loved. Mm. It's, it was the it's a human attribution. Creation. It's a human limitation attributed to God. I find it to be irrational. Yeah. This unity, this experience is known via direct experience. You could be, you could be as logical as you want. You could be as, as scientific as you want. This is beyond the grasp of science and logic. And it's the firmer of the two ways to God. Yes, you have one way to God, intellect. Intellect points to Allah, never encompasses Allah. But then you have direct experience. And if you read, you know, you ask me what's my favorite ayah. Uh, ayah. Mm -hmm. Also, you know, ayah to nur You know, Ghazali writes heavily on this. Allah is a light that reflects. It's a re reflect. You have this reflection within you. This point of awareness within you. That escape, even the, the most hardcore atheists will tell you, they refer to it as a hard problem of consciousness. We cannot explain the phenomenon of mind or consciousness. We have, we have no explanation for it. It's the hard problem, guys. We cannot put it in a test tube. We, we're, spe we're speechless when it comes to this. One of my favorite quotes is a quote by uh, Thomas Huxley. And I like it because he was an agnostic. He was Darwin's bulldog. Even from their side, when we bring this to the table, you know, Thomas Huxley said, look, the idea that brain matter, when it gets excited, we have the emergence of a mind, is the same as when Aladdin rubbed a lamp and a magic genie came out. It's that miraculous. We take it for granted because it's so direct. Allah is so obvious. God is so obvious. Not the content of your consciousness. That's dunya. But this experience, this innate knowledge we have, the sign of Allah that we have within us, is so in your face that you take it for granted. But when we bring it to the table in front of philosophers, even their speeches, even they say, look, we can't say it's not true because it's undeniable. To have a conversation, you have to presuppose the mind. You have to admit to it. Your every word is an admission. Your every word is an admission of the mind. You're, you can't argue against it because if you argue against it, you're presupposing it. It's inescapable. It encompasses everything. It's so obvious. It's so blatantly in our face that we take it for granted. But even when we bring the atheists to the table and we point to it and we bring, they're speechless in front of it. They're like, we don't know. It's the greatest this science. escapes science. This escapes our logical thinking. Leibniz had a beautiful example of this, and, I, and I'll, I'll take a pause after this because and I've been talking too much. We opened up the, the box. This is what we wanted. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, Leibniz had a, a beautiful thought experiment. He used a windmill. I don't use a windmill. I use the human brain. Imagine I was walking around in, inside the human brain. I was really, really tiny. I'm walking around inside the human brain. I'll see neurons firing. I'll see brain matter. I'll see blood flow. I'll see you in a certain brain state. I can observe the... The, the external effects of your brain but I'll never no matter how logical I am no matter, no matter how uh, uh, in, in, uh, sophisticated I am no matter what technology you give me uh, scientific technology no matter how, how logical I am I'll never perceive the mind I only know you have a mind because I have one as well so that's a, that's a logical leap there see how, you, how the way you know the mind is how you know Allah it's a gift you know it and you can't deny it because your every argument presupposes mind it's undeniable. If you try to doubt it, you'd be proving it. You try to argue against it, you just proved it. This is why we say, La ilaha illallah. At one point, this, there's, a there's a place where there's no doubt. Doubt is impossible. But to go on this journey, it's a very, the Ghazalian journey is a very long one. You know, and, and, it, and, it, and it ends with, there's, Allah is the one true, undeniable, objective truth. Nothing is true like Allah. Allah is al-haq. Allah is the only perfectly objective truth. Everything else is true but subjective at the same time and dependent. Its truth depends. However, Allah's truth is directly known. It's objective. It's not, it's not subject to what we spoke earlier to universals. That's beautiful. I think um, the, the power behind a lot of this, number one, in terms of like the philosophical explanation to this, I think as Muslims, like it really um, is of benefit because it helps us dig through these assumptions that you're describing. You know, the idea that the nature is something which we project, you know, this, this sort of concept. Very strong, very powerful, particularly, um, you know, today in terms of what we're being bombarded with. I think also in terms of like having an understanding around things 
whether like the you know consciousness being able to be measured or uh, th this is this is really important because scientism is of, often pushed on us like science is the only way to truth and so like we grow up in an education system that sort of pushes this within our science classes and we're not cognizant of it so i wanted to ask you specifically around ideological influences um, it is a bit of a step change, but like liberalism is something that's being pushed onto our youth today mm. a lot. And, you know, our parents who migrated over here aren't necessarily aware of, you know, all the philosophical conversations that are happening, the ideologies that are being pushed. They're just trying to make ends meet and provide for their kids. And so we grew up through a mm. system that's pushing certain values onto us, certain mm. ideas. So tell us, like, how do Muslims grapple with the idea of liberalism? But, but, <laughs> <laughs> but before that, actually, I just want to make Please a really, really important point, guys. I don't deny science at all. I want you. Guys, I want to make perfectly clear because on the Rogan podcast, that people thought I was a science denier. You know, I'm science. Not at all. Huh? I'm an absolute lover of science. Admiration. I absolutely love science. Razeli absolutely love science. He didn't use the term science, but he called he called it demonstration. We don't deny science at all. The dunya is the power of Allah. It's the creation of Allah. Yes. We study the dunya, and whatever we find, that is to the best of our knowledge, what the case is. I don't believe in any way, shape, or form that science is some type of conspiracy. Not at all. Science is, is cross-examined, scrutinized. Yes, there's a paradigm. Yes, there's human limitation. And in science, you know, I got, I got so many emails after the Rogan podcast. I'll tell you something. <laughs> if you don't understand the problem of induction, if you don't understand the problem of causation, if you don't understand these two things, you can never truly understand science. And it's a very complex topic, which we can't necessarily speak about today. But if you don't understand these two things, you can never understand what it means to have an inductive truth. Inductive truths are limited because we never have the totality of evidence. Science can change over time. Scientific facts have changed over time. I gave the example on the Rogan show, of course, that you know we used to all be all our, all our greatest thinkers thought that the sun rotated around the earth, and then Copernicus came and flipped it around. We were one hundred percent wrong. The greatest minds were not wrong; they were one hundred percent wrong. It was the complete opposite that was true. The sun doesn't go around the earth. The earth goes around the sun. It's completely opposite. They had a lot of incredible logical arguments for why they believe the earth stood still. You know why Aristotle thought the world stood still? Can I have a, can I have a pen, please? Pen. A pen, a pen, yeah. Look. You got a notepad. Look, 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 look. Look, when I, when I, drop, when I let go of this pen, it falls towards the earth. Mm -hmm. Everything he noticed falls towards the earth. Did you notice everything falls towards the earth? It's like everything's coming this way. There's a direction. He said to himself, look, if the earth was rotating, you know, when you, when you drive outside your car and you stick your hand out the window yeah. and the car is moving, there's a wind. Aristotle was like, where's the wind? If I stop my car, there's no wind. Mm. He's like, hey, the wind is not constant. If, of course, he didn't know. He didn't know that there's an atmosphere. He didn't know that, hey, the air is moving with the entire earth. He didn't know these other, he, he had it. He had it. We never have the totality of evidence. Yes. He was limited in scope and he made a generalization. That's science. In science, we go from, and this is, in epistemology, when we study what is science, we say, look, you go from a limited number of particulars and then we have to make a generalization. Ultimately, science is a type of generalization. It's the inductive method. Now, if you didn't study epistemology, this might be news to you. But let me tell you something. In the field of epistemology, nothing I just said is revolutionary. Mm. It's very, very well understood that science, it goes from particulars and makes a universal claim. He looked at particulars and he made a universal claim and in many instances, he was wrong. However, in his human, in, for, in, in his time, he was considered the best of human intellect. That's why earlier I was telling you, we cannot trust human intellect. We cannot trust it to be perfect. We will make errors. In a thousand years from now, a hundred years from now, one year from now, we can find many errors we've made. Science have gone through, has gone through many facts that are overturned. What I'm saying is science is our best approach to studying the dunya even though it's not perfect this is Ghazali's view is my view I think it's completely I think Muslims should be masters of science I don't know if you guys know this but the scientific method itself the modern scientific method was made created by Muslims yes Muslims should be masters of science so I'm a big believer in science and Ghazali had you know a whole we won't talk about it today but he had a whole system of how to approach science and religion you know they both should be complementing one another. It's not one over the other, etc. This is something I think Muslims really need to focus on and study the great thinkers. Because all the problems we're having today, they had them in the past. Yes. Mm -hmm. We're not new to these problems. You know what I mean? So uh, I think it's, it's, it's a shame that Muslims are not aware and are not experts in this work. That's a good point. And I think the, the point being as well that, you know, uh, 
the this as you mentioned Ibn Haytham developed the the scientific method and there was never this tension with science this exactly. is a modern phenomenon exactly in my opinion look all due respect that's a influence from other religions that converted to Correct. Islam who brought those brought that baggage in with them mm-hmm. and they popularized and we adopted their attitudes over time that's right which I find it to be a little bit uh, uh Uh, troublesome for us you know because originally the muslims the classical muslims in the golden age they didn't have this attitude at all they had a very d- different attitude if something is true bring demonstration bring us demonstration if the demonstration is sound we'll accept it and we'll move on accordingly so you know i'm i'm a big believer that this has to be done and if we adopt nominalism if we go back to nominalism we'll understand you know because he- here's the thing if you put it in a nutshell if you put it in a nutshell Even the atheist, he sees order in the universe. Muslims, we see order in the universe. Christians, Jews, we see order in the universe. They see order. They just say that the, the argument boils down to blind forces. They say we're a product of blind forces. We say, no, we're a product of God. It's purposeful. Mm. In the Quran, the, the, the first, the, sorry, not the, 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 in our tradition, in Islam, the first thing created is the pen. Everything is planned. The world is deterministic. However, they attribute it to blind forces. This whole world came to be because of blind forces. I like to give a thought experiment about walking into a garden. Imagine me and, and maybe, uh, who's your favorite atheist? Give me your favorite atheist. Sam Harris. He's not my favorite, but he's the most prolific. I don't, don't want to be with, I don't like That's that guy. That's contentious. He's not my, my favorite. <laughs> next, next. I don't like, I don't like. Uh, Do- okay, Dawkins. You're walking into a, a garden with Richard Dawkins. Imagine You walk into it. No, you're walking in a jungle. You're walking in a jungle with Richard Dawkins. And then through the jungle, as you wake your way through the jungle, you come into a garden. And in the garden, there's a, it's, it's, it seems designed. Like the yellow roses are with the yellow roses. The pink roses are with the pink roses. There's a place to sit. There's a bench. There's a welcome, Richard. Welcome to the garden. There's a message. And there's a beautiful canopy. And the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a fountain made for, with cups. And everything is organized. There's a knife and fork. There's a, you're like, wait a second. There's a gardener. There's, there's, a, there's something, you know, there's, there's, there's a design here. Richard's going to tell you, no. There's so many jungles. There's so many. It's just an astronomical number that you so happen to have stumbled on a place where it says, welcome, Richard. Imagine you had a, you had a huge message written in stone. Richard's going to tell you, look, there are so many. There are so many gardens in the universe. This is what the, the argument boils down to. The world, the dunya is a cosmic fluke. It's a cosmic sneeze. Probability. It's a probability. Think about it. it. Now, that's the whole reason why they believe in uh, multiverse. Because if we only had one, the, the, the universe is so fine-tuned. I'm not going to get into it, but the universe is so fine-tuned. It's so exact that they had to imagine now there must be other universes. Like the foam of the sea, they say. You see the little bubbles in the sea? Imagine an uncountable, un, an imaginable number of universes. Give me as many as you need because... That's how many I need to, to make it so that it says, <laughs> welcome Richard Dawkins. So there's a garden out there that says Richard Dawkins, but it, there's a s- spelling error. And there, every possible combination has been done. That's their claim. But the Quran says, this is what the Quran criticizes them for. The Quran says, look, they only see the outward things. They don't consider their own selves. The Quran criticizes them for not. So here's what I would tell Richard Dawkins in that state. Because his, his thing is, look, there's no one perfect God who hit the perfect shot there's no one existence no no there's so many the number is astronomically unimaginable that's why you have this exact message the Quran says consider your own self that would mean we are dunya we are part dunya my mm-hmm. biology my brain chemistry is just atoms and the void It's just billiard balls hitting one another. So that means that every word I'm saying right now, every logical argument I've been making, when I tell you one plus one equals two, that's a byproduct of blind forces. He would have to say that every logical argument he's ever made is just noise the universe is making. It's what we call absurdism. They have to claim the universe to be absurd. Even their own philosophical position now is defeated by their own claim. They're telling you my position is absurd. Because they're not really using logic. Even atheists like Thomas Nagel agrees with me. He says, look, I'm not going to get into his, his view because it's, it's a bit nuanced, but that would mean that his very belief is noise the universe is making. It's not, he, he's not using logic. 
It's a cosmic sneeze. Every The words are coming out of my mouth right now. They're going into your ear and you're having an experience of reason, logic. How could that possibly be if there's not a rational God? You understand? Our rational experience comes from reason. Uh, an easier, this is, look, I, I challenge any atheist to, to argue against that. But a more an easier example to to follow because I might I know, I know I understand it most people be like I, I, I can't wrap my mind around it. Imagine we're gonna create a universe. Okay, we're gonna create a universe. What's the first thing we need? We need power. Okay, so we need power to create power. How's that possible? There have to be power in existence for you to create power. Yes or no? Yeah. Okay. So power had to be always. We can't create power. It had to be there. You understand? Same thing with the reason. We can't have a blind forces and create reason. It could never happen. It'll never arise. He's in a self-defeating position. If This is what we call small circle. That's what I like to call small circle philosophy. Very few f thinkers will go this far. They, they reach a certain level of logic and then they quit. It's enough logic for me. I'm going to watch TV. I'm going to eat a meal. I'm going to get distracted by the world. But logicians who keep pushing, 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 pushing. Ghazali kept pushing, pushing, pushing because he wanted certainty. He came to the point where there could be no more doubt. And the same thing with reason. When you push reason to a maximum, you can you, you realize that the, the belief in blind forces is just another fake God. It's another, it's another false God. It's polytheism. It's, it's another. It's just it's like nature. It's a projection of the mind. It's the way I comfort myself. That's why I tell you, like, atheists are truly, and I don't mean this as an insult, but I believe they're polytheists. They believe in all sorts of gods. And for me, those, their gods are, for me, and I don't mean there's an insult, they're imaginary. They're yeah. projections it's of the mind. anything to escape God, just an admittance an admit that a God exists. It's just anything. Give me anything. Give me probability. Give me one in a bazillion. It's worse than just that. Just avoid it's a worse than that. God. It's an appeal to a, a demonstrably false God. Correct. So I, I think there's there's a few things uh, come I want to get to. I think um, we've unpacked Philosophy much, and sorry. God, it's huge. It's, it's a huge <laughs> topic. It's, absolutely, it's, it's like a mammoth of yeah, a topic. Sorry. But we've got no, liberalism on the agenda. Yes, yes, yes. The biggest argument against liberalism from an Islamic perspective to, I guess, uh, armor Muslims to protect them in this time. What's the mm. best argument we can give against liberalism? Look, you know what I tell my kids? Because in, in my country, very much like this country, we're bombarded with their way of life. We're bombarded. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't, want to impose my way of life on anybody, but I also demand that they don't impose their way of life on me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's fair, yeah. If they're going to tell us about their ideology, I want—I demand to be also teach my ideology. I want to compare our two ideologies. No, no, no. Mine is censored and theirs is promoted in the schools. I find that to be unfair. If you're going to teach ideology, teach all the major ideologies and give us a voice as well. its I think it's unfair. They say they want to treat everybody equally. Okay, treat me equally. I tell my kids never discriminate. I want to make that super, super abundantly clear. Don't discriminate on anybody. They don't have a deen. They don't have haram and halal like we do. To them, a boy and a girl is the same thing. A man in a dress or a woman in man's pants, to them it's the same thing. Okay, that's their deen. That's their way of life. And I use deen in the, word, in the, in the, in the strictest sense. Their way of life. I'm happy to sit at a table and discuss why their way of life, how we compare. And why I live my way of life, why we have our way of life, why we believe in what we believe. I'm happy to have a civil discussion. I want it to be abundantly clear. I always teach my kids never discriminate. However, when they try to tell my kids that this is right and wrong, I disagree with them. My kids go to school to learn math, science, history, logic, the laws that they're, they're, they're obliged to, to live by. And then the rest, morality, leave it to me. Mm -hmm. I don't need you to teach my kids morality, what's right and wrong. We have our own values. You know? our own I have my own values. I have my own way of life. You know, I tell my kids in, in liberal values, John Locke, the pursuit is find what makes you happy, but don't harm others. This is, this is their, their, if I could put it in a nutshell, do what makes you happy, don't harm others. If I could put it in a nutshell, that's how I would lump it up. It's, on the face of it, it's a beautiful thing, right? Okay, be, be, make, do what makes you happy, but don't harm another person. Wow, it's like, create. you'd think it could create harmony. I tell my kids, look, if you pursue your happiness, you're going to find misery. Ultimately, if you live a selfish life, if you think about me, if you wake up every morning and you think about me, ultimately, ultimately speaking, I tell my kids, you're going to reach, you're going to find misery. I wake up in the morning, I tell myself, this is the hierarchy of my life. First is Allah, God. Second is the family. And then maybe third place, 
I'll make time for me. Even me, I don't even want a third place. That's the same hierarchy in Islam. Like, uh, of course, this is where I learned it. Brother, this is where I learned it. I'm not making this up. I learned, I'm telling you, like, that's how I tell my interlocutors when I talk to them. I say, look, us, our view of the world is God first, the family, and then when I, when I study Islam, I look at Islam. Islam is giving us this order. Then the byproduct of this formula will be happiness, mm. inshallah. inshallah. So I tell them, look, you're pursuing your own individual personal paradise and then tomorrow it's going to be between mine and yours is happiness well guess what I'm going to step on you to get mine whereas in the Muslim world no your happiness is just as important as mine we have a cohesion a harmony at least to bigger and better things and also Allah is above us all yes I'll never praise myself or praise you I want to praise you I'm thinking about Allah I say alhamdulillah God gave you this gift what a gift you have it's all directed in the same direction I'm happy when Allah gave you a gift. Inshallah, Allah will bless me as well. But I don't have a jealousy mm. because your gift that you receive is from Allah. It's not to your your genius or your 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 uh, hard work or whatnot. Alhamdulillah, Allah blessed you with this ethic. Everything is back to Allah. We're pointing all in the same direction. You know when I when I saw Khabib watch Makachev win his title, you saw how happy Khabib was happier than when he won the title. Allah blessed Makachev. We're all happy for him. Like if I won the title. You understand? So this is far greater uh, level of happiness. This is a far greater human experience. Not only is Islam true, it's more pragmatic. It's more useful. You know, I, like in the West, you know, people love music concerts. And I understand like when they listen to the same song, they're all elated. They're all like on one page. But that's what we live day to day in Islam. When we pray, when we're all on the same page. We're all on the same channel. We're all connected. And human beings were made to be connected. Adam alayhi salam, when he was in the Garden of Eden, he felt a sense of loneliness. This is a, this is a powerful story in the Quran. Even in the Garden of Eden, he sent, felt a sense of loneliness. You're, you can have everything in the dunya, but you'll still be missing. If you, don't, if you don't have a good relationship with your brother, with your wife, with your family. If you don't have this community, Allah made us to be, uh, live us in a sense of community. This is so important, so paramount. But in the West, we don't have this uh, view. That's secondary to my happiness. That's why if you look at the West, the, the, we have broken homes, a lot of broken homes. It's a major challenge. You know, the birth rate is dipped. Family is an afterthought. I'm going to go to school. I'm going to party. I'm going to have a career. And then maybe, maybe I'll have one kid. And then my kid's going to live their own life. Because in, 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 the, in the liberal worldview, you got to do what makes you happy. You got to, so everybody goes in their own direction. Maybe your son has purple hair. Maybe your daughter thinks she's a man. Maybe well, maybe your wife, she wants to be on uh, OnlyFans. I know to you guys it's hard to hear, but mm. it's, a, it's a reality. Your wife does OnlyFans. Yeah, that's her life. You know, <laughs> I have, you know, students of every walk of life and I love my students. They're good. But yeah, that's her life. She's going her way. That's her happiness. Man, what is that doing collectively, mm. collectively, you're not, so you're not in, you don't have no synergy here. You're not living the highest level of happiness. Islam is about the highest level of human experience. You know, Peterson, I, I respect Peterson, but he said, look, the highest truth is love. He's wrong. He's wrong. Worship is the highest, tr uh, highest truth. Worship. Let me tell you why worship. If I told you, I love my wife, you'd be like, oh, that's nice. If I told you I worship my wife, you, you would cringe inside. Why? You'd be like, no, that, that's only for one. That's only for Allah. That's so special. No man should ever say he worships his wife. No woman should ever say she worships her husband. Worship is higher than love. And it's so special that it's only for one. And we're all directed to, to that one. This is the whole purpose of creation. It's in the Quran. Allah didn't create you other than for this. The worshiper is happy to ex exercise this. And the one to worship this is... I don't want to say Allah is, uh, Allah accepts our worship doesn't need it but, accept, but this is the highest human endeavor when you point all, every humanity in this direction they'll be cured from nihilism Allah created nihilism for those of you who don't know nihilism is your every fear your every nightmare your every anxiety that you have Nihilism is the cause of every discomfort you have. And there's only one solution. I don't care how much money you make. I don't care how much uh, resources you acquire. I don't care how much bodily pleasure you have. Ultimately, nihilism will consume you 
There's only one way out. There's no other way out. And the human will learn this at the, on his deathbed or he'll learn it in his youth. He'll learn it sooner or later. I tell people, I don't care how much of a happy life you had. You followed the liberal values. You had the happiest life. On your deathbed, you're going to feel so much misery. If you didn't find God, you're going to feel so much misery. You're going to wish you never existed. The guy who lived, a, contrast that with a, a man who lived a horrible life. He had pain and suffering and misery. He's happy to die. The guy who had the beautiful life, he doesn't want to die. Oh, he could talk bravely now because it, to him it's a distant thought. But wait, wait till death is close. He's going to feel so much anxiety. He's going to feel so much torment. The more beautiful your life was, the more torment, the more difficult it is to let go. Islam is so much more profound than most Muslims ever experience. And I find that to be a type of... I feel bad. Islam offers so much more than what Muslims take from Islam. And I hope that Muslims learn, inshallah, to, to reach reach higher levels of understanding. Because this is all in the Quran. It's all in the Quran. However, we've been limited in a way. It's almost like you can think deeply, but not so deep. But the Quran tells you that the one defines the Muslim, tells you he's always in thought. Pondering, contemplating. Pondering, contemplating. Sitting, sleeping, uh, in every state. He's always in a deep thought. Contemplation, deep thinking is not haram. It's mandatory. And it'll make your, inshallah, will develop your stronger faith. Me, I laugh at Dawkins' arguments. I find them to be weak, daif, pathetic. I would love to be in a room with him. I would love to be in a room with him. I have no doubt that his arguments, to me, I'm impervious to his arguments. Impervious. It's like, uh, I, I don't want to sound arrogant here, but I find them to be Absurd. A central, a central argument in his book is that God would need a creator. He's just pushing the problem back one step. That's an absurdity. Yeah. By definition, God doesn't. If God had a creator, he wouldn't be by definition. He wouldn't be God. It's an analytical certainty. This is like basic 101 philosophy, logic. Basic 101. He, he's, it, it's an absurdity. It's like saying, oh, a, a bachelor could be married. No, oh, that's, that's an analytical truth. A bachelor cannot be married. If he was married, he wouldn't be a bachelor. It's like basic, but yet it's a central argument in his book. He's not a trained philosopher. He's made millions. He's made billions. There's a market for atheism. Why? Because if atheism is true, everything's halal. Guys, mark my words. If atheism is true, everything is halal. Liberal, if liberalism is true, everything is halal. Why don't they let two, a brother and a sister sleep together? Oh, but that's gross. Oh, that's your own personal subjective judgment. Tomorrow in the future, they will tell you, no, it's okay. A brother and a sister, let them uh, engage in sexual relations. Why not? Uh, if, if the brother is uh, wearing a prophylactic or if the, uh, if the girl is barren or whatnot, there's no harm. What about son and uh, uh, father? Why not? Where is the line in the sand? Well, no, no, no. It's Now it's just your own personal tastes. If, if you went back 500 years ago and you told them, hey, uh, can you have a man and a man? They would say, no, that's that's gross. We don't like that. Regardless of the religion. Today they say it's not gross. Tomorrow, what, what's in the future that's not gross? You cannot have, I'm, I'm just, what I'm trying to, I make a, a very important point here. If there's no God, there is no right and wrong. Okay, This is basic Nietzsche. There's no d demonstrable morality. Remember this. If there's no God, Everything is permissible. So what Genghis Khan, you think Genghis Khan cared if his Mongols raped? To them, that's spreading Mongol seed, that's good. They're not beholden to anyone. That's your, if you have atheism as your central core doctrine of any civilization, it's a matter of time, it's a matter of time before that society self-destructs. Self-destructs. Now, if tomorrow, LGBT, it went from 1% to, I think now I believe it's 17%, massive growth. I think US, right? Uh, I think US. Yeah. yeah. And then tomorrow it's going to be 30, 40, 50%. At what point does it collapse? It's unsustainable. I tell my kids, you know, because my, my kids, when they go to school, they tell them it's, it's the same if you love a boy or if it's the same if you love a girl. I tell my kids, you know, I tell my kids, no, it's not the same. If I was gay, you wouldn't exist. Go tell your teacher. <laughs> <laughs> if his father was gay, he wouldn't exist. <laughs> There is social conditioning. And I can give you a thousand one examples. I don't want to go on a 10 different examples, but that's a solid one. We can indoctrinate our children. So I like to tell my children why we live a certain way. 
And it's important because the Muslims need to know why do we live this way? Well, I'm a big believer in survival and reproduction. Yes, I believe there's truth and the things we believe have to correspond. That's correspondence theory. We have to correspond to things in the world. If I, have an, if I say there's a pen on the table, if I go out in the world and there's a pen on the table, that's what we call correspondence. I have a claim and the claim, we can find a correspondent reality in the world. Truth has to be correspondent, but it also has to be pragmatic. Why would I teach my kids a philosophy that will doom our progeny? Why? Why would I do that? Why would I accept or cultivate a, an ideology that spells my doom? And I'm going to ask you a question. Why do you think they want you to adopt it so badly? What's, what's the motive? Like, what's the end game? There is a group of people that you can call the fastest growing people on the face of the earth. And I think they mm. want to slow that down. Very the quickly. Muslims. I think Pew Research is saying that we're going to be one third of the Earth's population. We're already one quarter, one in four people. You don't think this impacts them more than it impacts the Muslim world? I mean, the Muslim world is the only one that's really resisting this at the moment. I, I think so. I think, I think it's a way of keeping people down, to be honest with you. If you look at, I, I, I love every community, okay? I don't, have, I don't have a racist bone in my body. I would never say a racist thing, okay, honestly. But if you look at certain groups of people, the poorest communities, they're, they're, fatherless, they're fatherless communities. The research is clear. If you're born without a father, you have more chances of crime, um, unemployment. unemployment, suicide, drugs, misbehavior. That's how you keep a generation down. Teach them to be promiscuous. Teach them to run after their personal desires. And they'll never, they'll never scale to be a force. They'll never come out of poverty. That's how you can keep a people down. Make them love drugs, alcohol, promiscuity, Make them pay interest. They'll be poor forever. They'll never buy, they'll never own anything. Islam is the, is the solution to many of the poor community's ills. Let me tell you something. Why, why do people get married? What's the point? Let me tell you why, why. It makes total sense. That girl's pregnant. Who's responsible for that child? Well, we know she was married publicly to this man. We have witnesses. This man owes resources to that child. He has a responsibility to that child. And that woman, of course, she has to bear the burden of carrying him, feeding that child. She needs assistance. It's not fair that it falls onto the mother. It should be a, a dual uh, responsibility. Yet the man is free to run away, hide. Actually, in some societies, he's praised for doing it. Getting a girl pregnant and disappearing into the night. Oh, it's cool. For some people, it's cool. I find it to be child abuse. Mm. Look at single households, single mother households. The children, they have every vice, even lower IQ. Even IQ is lower. How could that be? Because the, they say that the child is going to be exposed to less words. Less words means lower IQ, etc. The nightmare is never ending. Mm. Worse is that child is very likely also to do the same thing his father did. The poorest communities are kept down not by chains or whips or, or by being police, but by culture. They're indoctrinated a culture. They're taught that it's cool to live this way and this is how you're going to be happy, but really it's a poison. They eat it up. They think it's wise to have sex at a young age and outside of marriage. Could you imagine if tomorrow every woman, and find, take, pick any poor area, and she said, look, I'm not going to have a baby. I'm not going to have sex until I get married. Well, guess what? Her, two or three generations from now, her family won't be poor. They'll come out of poverty. It won't take long. Imagine the whole, imagine all in all of the world, people refuse to pay interest or excessive interest, I should say. Just be specific. You know, when you want to buy a house, you have to pay three, four, five times over. The banker is sitting at home. He's sitting in the bank. He, he punched in some numbers on a computer. He attributed a value to your home. That's just vapor. He took it from vapor. You know, like, I don't want to get too much into economics, but if you if you do a service, let's say you paint my fence, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you, look, that you you painted my fence. Here's a hundred dollars. This hundred dollars represents the labor you you uh, contributed to society. You know, John Locke. This is John Locke, guys. We're always coming back to liberalism. John Locke. John Locke says, look, you have the right to your body and your labor. If you painted my fence, you have the right to that fence unless I pay you for it, because now I I paid you for your labor. This $100 represents my labor. Maybe I'm a baker. 
I baked 100 loaves of bread. I distributed it to the community and the community gave me $100 in return. You painted my fence. So I give you this $100. This $100 represents labor or a service, a product or service we contributed to society. The banker does no such thing. The banker punches numbers on a computer. He didn't contribute to the society. He create, took it from vapor. Not only that, not only that, he's going to charge you interest on it. If the entire world, if your, if your entire country assembled all the money we have and we gave it back to the bankers, we still owe the bankers money. You could never pay back the banker because he lent you money on interest. It's a, it's a great scam. It's a great ruse to keep people poor forever. 99% of people get rich via inheritance. Don't be fooled. That child has no father to give him inheritance. Not only that, he's going to pay the banker forever. But how did they keep them poor? Culture, indoctrination. It's, it's a type of poverty that's internal. They'll ne you'll never get out of the system. You'll never get a system. If they became Muslim, that's why Malcolm X wanted to bring Islam to that community, to, the, to, certain, to his community. They killed him. They would be out of poverty today, in my opinion. They'd be out of poverty. Why? Because they would have inheritance by now. You have intergenerational poverty or you have intergenerational wealth. If you have intergenerational wealth, you eventually get into politics slowly, slowly. Every great politician gets, gets into politics this way. And you, you call the shots. They keep their various cultures down, various people down using culture. Culture is a weapon. You know, you watch movies like Barbie. They say, oh, Barbie's just a movie. It's just, a, no, it's not a movie. It's a culture. You're teaching my children a culture. We absolutely got fried for responding to that movie. But I, I just actually <laughs> want to touch on that. Um, I want to touch on that because we are talking about this poison, but I actually see a counter effect actually taking place. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, wa makaru, wa makar Allah, wallahu khayrul makirin. They're plotting and they're planning, but Allah is also planning. So at the same time, I actually see this movement towards liberalism, towards no rules, towards endless freedom. I see it having a counter effect because it's actually opening people's eyes to the misery that it's comes along with this promise. It's but a false promise. And liberalism is unsustainable. I, like, I, have, I have respect for everybody out there who's searching. You know, we're all searching. And I think if you're being honest and authentic, I don't think any harm can come to you. I think if you're really, if you're trying your best to be a good and honest person and Allah gave you your faculties and that's what you, that's the best of your ability. I don't think any harm comes to you because I think, I think Muslims did a bad job presenting Islam. I think a lot of, I think Muslims should be aware, you know, because Sometimes we give a bad example of Islam. And no wonder they reject it. No wonder. You know, we give a bad, we portray Islam in a, a negative light. Okay? And I think Muslims are responsible for that. I think Muslims should show the best of behaviors and discuss and talk in the best of manners and not alienate people. You know, it's, it's our tradition to speak to people in the best of manners. Not to insult or, or ridicule or put down. I'm not trying to put down anybody. All I'm telling you is like, here's why I accept Islam. I'm certain of, about Allah. And here's why I want to teach my children to live a certain way. Because I care about my progeny. I care about my progeny more than I care about my own well-being. My neighbor, maybe he cares more about his personal happiness than he cares about his own progeny. You know, I, I, I have friends, I ask them, why don't you want to have kids? No, I don't want to have kids. For me, I want to just be uh, happy. Okay. That's his choice. I think he's going to find misery. But he doesn't think so. So let him play out his belief. And we'll see in the end who, who really uh, is going to benefit. You know, that's why I tell people, look, you're going to have to live your consequences. And in my opinion, liberalism is going to divide society. It's unsustainable. And you won't find happiness. It's, a, it's not true that at the end of that rainbow is happiness. Mm. At the end of that rainbow, in my opinion, is nihilism. Illusion. Nothing yeah. carries meaning. It's nihilism. Mm -hmm. Guys, your life is a blink of an eye. Your life is a blink of an eye. You know, so when you get to the finish line, you're going to be like, wait a second. I can't. I passed so fast. You know, it was my, you know, your life goes faster and faster. When you were one years old and you turned two, that was 50% of your life. That's a giant time span. 
When you went from 99 to 100, that's 1%. A year becomes like a day. Your life is, exp you're, you're, you're going towards death faster and faster every day. Every day your life becomes, a, a, a day becomes shorter and shorter. If you do the math, life is getting shorter at a high speed. When you went from one years old to two years old, that's 50%. Man, that year seemed like forever. Brother, do the math. I'll keep the math simple. When you go from 99 to 100, that's 1%. That year was 1%. That's, that's a, that was an instant. You're exponentially speeding towards death. You better make your peace with death. For us, we have about two last questions. But before we uh, finish up, You've spoken a lot and you've unpacked a lot from a philosophical perspective, from a perspective of, you know, breaking down arguments, reasoning with them, using logic to break them down. You've spoken about the happiness that, I guess, Islam provides to human beings. I want to tap into the mind of Farah Sahabi. Describe that feeling. Like it's enough to, from a personal perspective, describe that feeling of happiness that Islam gives you personally for us. I'll tell you something, the, the greatest joy in life is certainty of Allah. That's the greatest joy. Everything else is poverty. Uh, and I don't, I don't mean that to insult anybody else, but there's nothing else. There's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything else, there's only God. Everything else is a vapor. And this is the conclusion of Imam Ghazali in the, in the Mishkat. This is his ultimate conclusion. Now, can somebody read it and get to that conclusion? It's not an easy journey, my friends. You know, I studied philosophy for 20 years to understand Ghazali. Ultimately speaking, if all, you know, the Quran says something beautiful. When all has perished, there will remain the face of Allah. This is the greatest human experience. If you can bring yourself to have this experience, you know that everything else is poverty. Everything else is poverty. So this is what Islam is, ultimately speaking. Islam, you have different levels. Yes, Allah taught you to pray and wash your hands. But this is a prerequisite to go higher. Ultimately, it's tasawwuf. And tasawwuf, when you let go of all your vices, eventually you can climb even higher. And ultimately speaking, is the highest human experience is to worship Allah. And when you have a certainty of Allah, this is the greatest of all human experiences. Everything else is a type of poverty. So for me, uh, you know, grappling, jiu-jitsu, family, this is all great. But this is my duty you know, human excellence is, a, I believe, a human duty of every Muslim. Human excellence. You know, this is a hadith as well. But I'm not the best at quoting hadiths, but the stronger Muslim. You have to be a strong Muslim. And what strong means, that's a, that's a topic in itself. But your job is to be strong, not violent. Don't, don't confuse strong with violence, but be strong. Be, if you're an engineer, be the best engineer. If you're a thinker, be, like, be the best. Show me excellence, 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 excellence. It's a type of worship, etc. But ultimately, ultimately speaking, that's for a goal. Tasawwuf is the ultimate goal, purification of the, the self. Now, I'm not saying that I'm a, I'm a pure human being or anything like that, but at, at all, at all. I'm saying it's a journey. That's what Islam is about. Islam is a, it's an experience and a journey. And ultimately, it all points to the combination of having an experience with Allah, God. Islam, Iman, Ihsan. To worship Allah as though you see Him. Like that's like the highest level. Worshiping of Allah as though you see Him. SubhanAllah. And uh, we know like when people, well, when, inshallah, when we enter Jannah, that the best thing that Muslims are going to experience isn't Jannah itself. It's going to be seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah. And, the sight of Allah. And this, this is truly what our hearts call for. So that's beautiful. Um, last point. Uh, we'll put the philosophy to the side for a second. Coming back to Firas, the uh, black belt BJJ MMA expert. Um, you you have like a strong belief when it comes to self-defense and you know protection of family as you as you mentioned. Um, what's your advice out there for Muslims in taking steps to protect their families? Say uh, black belt for all your children. Is that like a condition? Yeah, for, for my kids, I, I give them a standard. Allah I think protect look, us. You have a standard for mathematics, right? Everybody needs to learn some level of mathematics, some level of geography, some level of history. I think you also need to add some level of martial arts training. Why? Because you need to defend yourself maybe one day. And it, it'll also affect your confidence immensely. And also you'll learn how to maintain your body, how to exercise the body. Now there's a gro growing phenomenon online of people injecting themselves with steroids and then they, you know, become very popular online. I think people need to know that there's a lot of fake actors 
on the internet. You know, like don't get like there's a lot of unrealistic expectations. That's not what I want to do uh, when I when I put my contact out there. Okay, a lot of people tell you I'm not on steroids, but they are on steroids, and you cannot get to that level without the chemistry. A great great point. A great example is the Liver King. You know, like you mm -hmm. didn't. You don't need to be a detective to know. Way to the, yeah. <laughs> you don't need to be a detective to know that man's on steroids. Oh, However, yeah. he claims not to be on steroids. Even by the way, he, he's a graduate in chemistry. By the way, I always said he was on steroids. You know, he, I can tell you that a human body can't develop that. That uh, it can't develop to that level without steroids. There's no exercise scientists not know how to develop a human being <laughs> like that unless he knows something we don't. He's obviously on steroids. He claims not to be on steroids, and unfortunately, there are people who believe that. Now he was exposed, et cetera. But what I'm saying is there's a lot of people out there still haven't been exposed. So I would tell, look, the Ummah, look, like the people out there, don't be fooled. Okay, there's a lot of unrealistic expectations. Find what's realistic for you. For my kids, because they live with a black belt and they're surrounded with black belts, for me, black belt, it makes sense because they get so much more exposure to jiu-jitsu and wrestling. And, but if, let's say, I don't know, maybe you live in a city where there's not a lot of martial arts or whatever, by videos and you learn in your garage okay maybe purple belt is your expectation be realistic maybe you're a full-time lawyer and you work five days a week you don't have more than x amount of time for developing your uh, martial arts skills your health etc make a realistic goal and achieve it it doesn't have to be black belt and be aware that a lot of people out there are promoting themselves because they want a shortcut it's really easy nowadays to get jacked up on steroids, make an Instagram page and get a lot of followers and fool a bunch of naive uh, people out there who don't know anything about exercise science training and, you know, their their heart's in the right place, but they're being fooled. There's a lot of bad actors in the world. So I would tell you, look, do something realistic. Be realistic. And you don't have to be world champion, but it should be somewhere in your life. Fitness, health, and I really think some level of martial arts for self-defense. Would you say for, can I ask this, would you say for sisters as well, for the women as well? Oh yeah, of course. I definitely think women should learn how to defend themselves 100%. Like I trained my wife in jiu-jitsu and I, I created an environment for her to learn jiu-jitsu and she learned jiu-jitsu in a safe, uh, friendly environment because it's also, a, it's a bit, you know, dangerous jiu-jitsu, a lot of injuries, but she's a legitimate blue belt. But for me, for my wife, I think she's happy blue belt. I'm happy with her being a blue belt. I don't think she needs more and that's the adequate amount. But I feel she could defend herself in a certain scenario. Yes, she's not uh, defenseless. That's not the case. But not everybody has the same uh, goal. And I think you should pick a goal that makes sense to you. But it shouldn't be zero. Especially when it comes to health. You should have some fitness routine. You'll be a happier uh, person if you have some level of fitness. You'll be more satisfied with yourself. And also, it's a greater day-to-day -day experience. You'll have more energy. You'll have more confidence. You'll feel more uh, vitality. Taking care of the body is incredibly important. I find it to be uh, fundamental. That was the body. What's that? That was the body. Body, what do you mean? How do you protect everything else? The mind. Oh, the, the mind. Spirit. Well, you know what? In our day and age, you better protect the mind. The day of having... No understanding about why the way you live. You know, the Muslims were hyper successful in Andalus. In Andalus, they were less than 50%. They were challenged by other ideas. The Muslims were hyper successful when they were challenged by other ideas because we could be in an echo chamber. When the, when the Muslims are 100% of the population, you don't have to think about these things. It's common knowledge. Complacency. It's complacency. We got lazy. Now today with social media and all that and, and discussion, I think the Ummah is going to go to the next level. Why? Because I truly believe you're upon the haq. We're upon the haq. And it's going to, we're going to work backwards maybe. Like we're going to rationalize backwards, re meaning we're going to reverse engineer our beliefs. But we'll find them to be there, true, and sturdy. But I'm happy the Ummah is getting challenged. I'm very happy because to me, the Ummah became a sleeping giant because... We were in echo chamber for long. We didn't need to. Not everybody. No, no, no. But the Muslims were great thinkers because they were challenged. At a point in time, if you study why Ghazali did what he did, and he had many uh, great rivals, many great thinkers around him. Why they did what they did is because they were challenged by other world views. And he wanted certainty. He asked, you know, Ghazali asked, don't you find it strange that the Christian is born Christian and the Jew is born Jew and 
the polytheist is born poly don't you find that strange like isn't it like he asked some very important questions but if he was in a in a population which is 100 muslim he would never need to ask that question oh we're all born muslim we all see we all have the same conclusion so it's going to heighten our senses so to speak inshallah for us zahabi it's been an absolute honor to be joined by the greatest trainer in the world the black belt that you know is a muslim alhamdulillah first and foremost a graduate of philosophy and an inspiration for millions of muslims around the world and non-muslims around the world for, throughout the fighting industry and abroad jazakallah khairan thank you so much if you have any last words by all means thank you guys thank you for having me jazakallah khairan thank you so much man it was a pleasure i'll be very quick that was for us zahabi on our podcast we are available on google podcast apple play and spotify until next time assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh